Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. I think for me, that's always what I'm looking for in any character. You know, you don't have to be the lead. You don't have to have all of the screen time, but you need to have a journey. Mm -hmm. You need to feel like your character starts at one place and ends somewhere else. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of In the Envelope. The voice you just heard is that of Gugu Mbatha-Ra, a terrific actor uh, who gave a terrific interview. But I want to introduce another special guest today, Katie. Hello. Hello. Hi, Jack. (laughs) How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, Could you introduce yourself since this is unbelievably your first appearance on this podcast. I know. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm Katie (laughs) Menard and I am the social media specialist at Backstage. I basically do all the social media, all those tweets, all those Instagrams you see. That's me. Everything. That's all you. (laughs) It's me. And what is going on in general? I mean, how, how is Backstage? How's your 2020 in the context of your work at Backstage. It's busy. Yeah, uh uh-huh. Yeah, with everything happening in the world. uh, Everything. You know, as soon as the pandemic hit and we're all at home, social media has taken a huge Hmm. portion of everyone's time up. Um, We're all on social media more than ever. So it's become a really, really big part of Backstage. We started the slate at the beginning of lockdown and that was a huge undertaking especially for social it's more social video than we've ever done before Mm -hmm. on instagram youtube and zoom which we had never done before um so i became a zoom expert very quickly Yes. yes yeah so it's been really exciting oddly enough and a really great time that we've been forced to under the circumstances figure out a lot of things on the fly, which has been a really interesting challenge. And I'm really proud of what we've done. Yes. Both with the slate and then, you know, everything happening in June with Black Lives Matter has been Mm -hmm. an incredible moment for the world, especially on social media, seeing the movement be such a huge part of social media and that being a huge huge driver of spreading information and resources and news is like incredible to watch as a social media like professional just seeing oh absolutely you know historic yeah it's historic and i I don't think it would be as huge right now without social which is incredible um and then seeing how brands have responded including backstage and i'm really proud of of backstage for taking a stance um and providing should be yeah uh as we should be and providing um, money and a platform for um, Black artists and creators and actors, as we always have, but making sure that we're thinking about it more than we were before, consciously. Totally. Yeah, so it's been <laughs> a time. <laughs> it's certainly been a time. And an interesting challenge is the perfect way to put it, because it has been interesting. And I think, again, you guys, all of us on this team, we have risen to the occasion of like figuring out what Backstage can do mm-hmm. and how how to use the platform and how to best adapt to the times and provide resources and information and yeah, advance the cause. I mean, I feel like it's been more of an, unof- inclusivity has been kind of a, more of an unofficial mission uh, among backstage editorial mm-hmm. content and on this podcast and in social media. And now we've gotten to make it explicit and yeah. to really use that voice and 
that's just been great to see. And it's it's ongoing. You know, it's going to keep going. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of changes that we made on social of being like, oh, we're going to make sure to repost these organizations that we're actively supporting. And mm-hmm. I'm like, we're going to continue that forever. I don't want to just do yeah. it when it's trending. You know, this is something that is all, always going to be part of our, our um, mission, you know. For th- any listeners who maybe don't know, of course, we include social media information in all of our episode descriptions. But could you plug where uh, can followers follow Backstage on Instagram and Twitter? Yeah. So on Twitter and Facebook, we are just at Backstage. Um, and on Instagram, we are at Backstage Cast. And mm-hmm. you can find so much content from us on all of those platforms. So much. Um, so much, especially right now. Especially yep. right now, especially on Instagram. <laughs> I, I'm really proud oh, of the stuff we've Backstage got. cast, Instagram is where it's at. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite parts of the slate is uh, our Instagram live interviews, mm-hmm. which is we go live with actors on Instagram. And it's yeah. it's great just to see you and <laughs> Ben Lindsay and... Uh, Hannah Marie Williams go live yes. and just chat with celebrities just chat. Yeah. who are also just stuck at home, just the stars. They're just like us, you know? <laughs> well, this is great. One more thing we have to mention before we get to this excellent interview with Gugu Mbatha-Ra is that this episode of In the Envelope, the Actress podcast is the hundredth episode of In the Envelope, the Actress podcast. So many anyone... times you've had to talk. <laughs> So many times. Yes. It's incredible. A yes. uh, hundred episodes is huge. It's a hundred episodes. If you go to any, a couple of the different platforms will we'll have that number of the number of episodes. And um, I am, we're of course recording this before we release it. So I am excited to see that number become a three digit number. Yes, three <laughs> digits. In the hundreds. It's really wild. Really wild. One day it'll be four digits. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> one thing at a time, Katie. One thing at a time. Um, well, thank you for joining me to commemorate that. Um, listeners, I know we hit you at a lot of podcasts this week, considering it's the third interview of the week, but it's a really good one. So we're going to take a quick break here from our sponsor and then introduce Gugu. But Katie, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me and on such a historic episode. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Yes. Thank you for being my co-host. And um, we will see you over social. Thank you. Can't wait to see you all there. Today's podcast is brought to you by the Apple TV Plus original series, The Morning Show. This drama series explores the cutthroat world of morning news and the lives of the people who help America wake up in the morning, told through the lens of two complicated women working to navigate the minefield of high octane jobs while facing crises in both their personal and professional lives. Starring Jennifer Aniston, Reese Witherspoon, Steve Carell, Billy Crudup, Gugu Mbatha-Ra, and Mark Duplass. For your Emmy consideration in all eligible categories, including Outstanding Drama Series, visit fyc.appletvplus.com. Gugu Mbatha-Ra has been a chameleonic up-and-coming star since studying at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, appearing on British stages and TV series, and then breaking out with her award-winning turn in the feature film Belle. She's appeared in Larry Crown, Beyond the Lights, Black Mirror San Junipero, and this year the film Misbehavior and Apple TV Plus's The Morning Show. Here's our interview with the stunning Gugu Mbatha-Ra. Oh my gosh. Um, Gugu, thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, I know that you are quarantining in Los Angeles, and I know this because of your lovely um, Harper's Bazaar article or essay that you wrote about it. Oh, yes. Lockdown in La La Land. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
Did yeah. you come up with the headline as well? I certainly did. I certainly you did. did. Cool. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I was on the cover of their March issue in mm-hmm. Harper's Bazaar UK because uh, my movie uh, Misbehavior was set to come out there right at right. sort of the sort of outset of quarantine, unfortunately. But right. um, but yes, and so they asked me to write about my experience and. Um, it was it was interesting because at, at first I was in shock, you know. I think as we all have been and mm. and still are in, in, in to degrees, you know. I said I can't I can't write anything. I I just I'm just dealing with day by day this kind of jolting experience of suddenly yeah. just being in my house. Um, but then you know over time over a couple of weeks I had. Um, had a few experiences that inspired me, you know, um, to, to write that piece. And actually cool. it was, it was very therapeutic to be able to, mm. you know, talk about how we're processing this time as well. Yeah, no, I mean, it was helpful to read. We, maybe we'll link to it in, in today, in the episode description of, of this, because, um, you know, on this podcast, we're all about asking for, you know, advice for early career artists and mm, actors. Mm. But recently, it's been in the context of this of this crisis and of everything yes. that's happening in our world. Yeah, I think that you you summarized it well, but not not quite summarized. I mean, there's nothing to how do you come to a conclusion about a time as bizarre as this? Well, exactly. And also I wrote that piece at the beginning of week four of quarantine. And now right. I don't know what week we're in, but we're like two months <laughs> later. So I need, I probably need it's to do a, a follow-up article because so much has happened in the world since then. It already feels yeah. almost a, a historic document. Um, <laughs> it is yeah. a record. Yeah, it's yeah. a record of a time in history. I mean, mm-hmm. honestly, it, uh, whenever this, this interview is released from the time it takes us to record the interview to release it, everything will have changed again, probably. Mm, mm. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, initially, I was looking at articles, you know, and pieces of writing by F. Scott Fitzgerald, you know, that he wrote during mm. a quarantine in, in the the 1918 flu pandemic you know and that those are fascinating you know initially those were sort of going around on whatsapp groups and things like that and you know Mm. finding inspiration from and resilience i think from understanding that as as jolting and unprecedented as these times are people Mm. have had those types of times before and got through it and and yes that, that has always sort of given me hope um and I do think we're evolving. I think, you know, hopefully positive things will come from from all yeah. of the, the disruption. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned that the writing part was therapeutic. Are there other things you're doing to kind of restore the energy and give you hope? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I have good days and bad days, I think, like everybody, sure. you know, some days I feel really productive and other days I think, God, what happened to today, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I've been painting. That's been something that cool. I've certainly rediscovered in this time um, in terms of painting portraits of friends and family and um i recently did a portrait of george floyd uh which i posted Mm. on instagram and you know just finding a way to channel and focus all of the emotions and feelings you know um artistically you know because mm. sometimes we don't always have the words and we can't always formulate you know we don't always know what what to do um and i think whenever i don't know what to do i find painting is something that mm. really soothes me and helps helps me um just feel connected to the present yeah i think that's a really beautiful point that it, art is how we express or process and art is something that can guide us through mm times like these I suppose Mm. certainly painting yeah yeah well it's I mean for me I you know I haven't done it for a long time I loved it growing up but it's almost feels like um, a a meditative experience for me I think I I get into Mm. that flow state you know I can I I can suddenly you know lose track of time and and I I think when there's so much uncertainty in the world and we're all looking for you know a a schedule and a and a a sort of when are things going back to normal type of um date or something uh to be able to get into the flow state and really focus on something and also as I said to to be in the present I think so often most causes of anxiety are about worrying about the future I mean I, I was talking to a friend the other day who said you know I mean and again I'm not a 
a psychologist, I don't, you know, but she said that, you know, the difference between anxiety and depression and, you know, one anxiety being worrying about the future, depression being, you know, very mm. oversimplified version, but being more worried about the past and, and dwelling in the past. Mm. And actually, the more ways that we can find to be in the present moment, um, yeah. the, he- the healthier, the healthier our psyches are. Yeah, I've been thinking about that too, that this crisis has actually sort of forced us into the present moment, mm. which is the Buddhist, you know, that's the that's the goal for many of us is to stay in the present. Mm. But as you said, there are good days and bad days. And Absolutely. There are days when I'm completely dwelling on this uncertainty in the future mm. or, or yeah, the, the past. It's also interesting you're talking about artistic expression because in this essay, I'm going to read from this essay because you said, understanding how superfluous actors are in a crisis such as this, I come to, I come to terms with the fact that staying at home as passive as it may seem is my contribution for now. Correct me if I'm wrong, you were you were in the middle of filming a project when mm. this was all interrupted. Like yes. what has your relationship with acting, how has that evolved in the last couple of months? Because for the most part, actors are not able to use that as their artistic expression. Yes, I was in Atlanta. I was filming Loki uh, for Which Mar- is huge. Marvel. Yeah. yeah, a whole other huge. world. And um, very excited to, to be doing that. I also just got back from London um, to do the premiere of Misbehavior over there. <laughs> so, um, you know, I came back um, to Atlanta uh, on, on the premiere. It was in London on the Monday. I came back on the Tuesday went to work for a couple of days on Loki. And then by the Friday of that same week, we were put into hiatus. And, and then, you know, I came back to LA, Mm. and it was subsequently a a lockdown. So um, Mm. it was a very, I mean, as for everybody has that, that those um, stories of that, that week when the world changed. Um, But uh, yeah, I realized, obviously, we're not frontline workers, actors, Uh, Mm. you know, um, obviously, art is definitely has has its place. But but in a crisis, um, Mm. you know, it's very humbling, um, I think, for you know, everybody to remember and, and appreciate the people that perhaps we have overlooked, you know, the healthcare workers, the grocery store workers, you know, all of yes. those people that have become so essential to us in this time. Um, you know, I mean, t- to contribute in my way, I was, you know, shell stacking in, in, in my local grocery store, which is mm. a family owned, quite over overwhelmed business when everybody mm. was panic buying. But in terms of acting, mm. no, you, you really can't, do that by yourself. I mean, you know, you can you can right. do a, a monologue on on Zoom or post something, go on Instagram <laughs> Live, or you know, it, do do whatever. You, but it's really such a collaborative collaborative yeah. business, which is why I love it. The one thing that I have been able to do, and, and it took me a while to adapt to this, but I'm excited because today's the day that I just finished recording an audio book oh, from really? my closet. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, I converted. I mean, so many actors have been doing this. Obviously, yes. it's what can you do from home? How can you adapt? And uh, voice work, you know, uh, podcasts, voiceovers, yeah. audiobooks is something that, you know, with technology, if you have the gear and you have a space uh, that you can adapt. Um, Completely you can work, you know, so that was kind of amazing for me in that just before all this happened, I had a, an offer from Audible uh, to record Sense okay. and Sensibility. How amazing. <laughs> Oh, amazing. By Jane Austen. And, and, and I was going to do it in in their one of their studios somewhere, you know, yeah. uh, in London or wherever. And around week three, I, I said to my agent, well, hang on. I mean, I, could I just do could it? Could I just, can we just start? Can I just maybe? And so I was doing webinars, figuring out how to convert my closet wow. space acoustically into, yeah. um, you know, a more of a audio space booth uh i mean you know don't get me wrong it definitely doesn't look anything uh, (laughs) to the eye yeah Yeah. but 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 technically you know how do you soundproof an area how do you um you know getting the the getting sort of up to speed with some of the recording programs learning how to do that getting my microphone ordering a microphone like getting all of that stuff delivered and so piece by piece i've just just today 
celebrating finishing <laughs> congratulations uh, reading a book <laughs> so that was wow. my you know and that was a very different muscle you know um yeah obviously working i'm being british but i've worked in an american accent for quite a while yes uh and, and being able to do something so so, so british. essentially british as jane <laughs> yes. austen you know took me back to things like bell you know and and, yeah. and the language of you know of a lot of the classics that i studied at rada so so that right. actually has been a a real escapism you know I've been saved by Jane Austen you know to be able to get into that world and um, yeah. distract myself from some of the the sad and you know terrifying yes. events going on in the real world at the moment oh Jane Austen is very escapist I actually I think we I think it was Sarah Snook we just featured someone on the podcast who said that um our lives are a Jane Austen novel right now because we're all <laughs> doing a lot more sitting around and reading. Oh, that's and like, interesting. I was <laughs> thinking it I is was, a bad sign. And yeah, all of that. I was thinking it was going a bit more George Orwell, but um, but Jane Austen <laughs> is. I think Jane Austen is the the optimistic uh, drawing Completely. room view. Uh, George yes. Orwell is is the is oh, the darker funny. the darker side. What but, is our um, world that Jane Austen and George Orwell is is where we sit right yeah, now? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is su- this is such a tangent, but this but recording an audiobook sounds like the kind of thing that we would love to hear about on this podcast. We're all about like the craft and the specific mm. tips and tricks. So, like, mm. uh, what what went into it? Are there a spe- is there a specific skill set for? That's a lot of reading that you have to do. It's a lot of reading and I had never this is my first time doing it. So it was yeah. it was a stretch for me, I have to say. I mean it was it was a challenge and it was um you know Austin's sentences just the structure of her sentences are just so mm. dense um and not really mm. obviously how we it's a classic obviously it's got it's mm. it's dense. Um but you know technically just vocally just you know learning about you know Mike microphone technique I mean obviously I worked with sound engineers remotely you know the director was in London the sound engineer was in Spain and I was in LA you know and and so we were all able to loop together you know on an online program and um, obviously uh, you know the engineers got a lot of work cut out to, to edit it all together but I think you know it's just the power of I think when you set your mind to something how we can adapt and I think you know we have to evolve we have to evolve to the present moment we can't just sit Mm. around lamenting what was you know I (laughs) think um uh so so yeah it was a technical challenge and as I say getting through the script and annotating the script and and getting into the characters as well you know um it's been a real a real gift yeah, Kate, that's that's so cool to hear. We never we never get to talk about recording audiobooks. So, it's, <laughs> so congratulations on just just finishing a Jane Thanks. Austen audio. <laughs> it's very cool. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned Rada. Mm-hmm. I would love I would love to go back to the back to the beginnings because you you is it safe to say that your foundation is very much classical? You you did a ton of Shakespeare kind of before the um, stage to screen big transition that you yes. did, right? I actually yeah. saw you in. Um, uh, Hamlet on Broadway. Oh, you did! Wow, yes, at the did. Broadhurst in two thousand and nine. Wow. <laughs> yes, yeah. a while ago. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was such a pivotal year for me, really, um, mm. and such an incredible experience. Uh, not only to have my West End debut um, and my Broadway wow. debut and my first trip to America all oh, in one package. First... Wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah, it was. It was. It was incredible, and it really did change my life. I mean you know, we, we had such a wonderful, um, response, um, obviously Jude Law playing Hamlet, myself playing Mm -hmm. Ophelia and just, um, just an incredible British cast. And it was, it was, it was such a huge turning point. I think just being on Broadway, fascinating to do Shakespeare for a British audience and then an American audience and, and yes. how the audiences differ and, and a Broadway <laughs> audience, you know, it just such a different energy. <laughs> um, we even went and did it for a week in, in between in Denmark at Crumble Castle, uh, oh. which is, oh, you know, cool. the original Elsinore in, that inspired mm. Shakespeare. So, um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was a really special one. And, sh- and Shakespeare was a, was that a big part of RADA training as well? Did you kind of get the whole variety of training there? Yeah, it's, it's, um, we had a Shakespeare project at, at, at 
Rather, I did measure for measure. Um, mm -hmm. But, you, you know, you're always working on different texts and uh, different sonnets. And um, but but the, but it's not just Shakespeare. I mean, we started off with a more sort of Stanislavski based mm -hmm. module, mm -hmm. uh, more more method style um, term. Each term has a different focus, at least when I was there. Cool. Um, and then, you know, you do Ibsen, Chekhov, you do a lot of movement um, from animal projects to classical dance to alexander te cool. technique you know it's a mm. whole it's a whole um toolkit they want to give mm -hmm. you a toolkit of techniques um for, <laughs> for your career so um yeah i loved being there did you also you've said that you did you leave school early to, for your first paid theater gig yeah i did actually a little <laughs> bit early i mean i left one half a term early i i, I basically in uh -huh. the third year you're doing productions um for a, an audience uh, your third year shows um you do two a term and i'd done i'd had my lead role i suppose i'd done a lot of supporting roles and i had um, mm. a lead role and and then i got um the offer of playing um celia in as you like it and there was one more play left to do that term and i just thought <laughs> well you know i could do that play or i could just jump into the real world <laughs> <laughs> so cool. um so yeah and they obviously are very supportive if you've got work they want you to get going you know at that point so um, ah, okay. yeah yeah and then it was theater for for a while and then talk to me about the transition from theater to to screen first of all was was film, on camera acting always the goal or or a goal I don't know that I thought about it a lot. I have to say our training was so theater focused um right. and uh we had a small sort of TV module. I believe it's much more extensive now uh, since I've left. But when I was there, you know, we, we mm. basically filmed a scene from a movie. I remember filming a scene from Out of Sight um, mm. with like uh, the Jennifer Lopez, George Clooney uh, film. And, mm. you know, we analysed that and did a bit of sort of, you know, talked about acting for camera, but it, but it wasn't very in-depth. Uh, mm -hmm. when I was there um but no I mean I you know once I got an agent and I I worked a bit in theatre I did have tv auditions in the UK and I did you know my first tv job was on a, a medical long-running medical show that we have mm -hmm. in the UK called Hol Holby City you know which is sort of a baptism of fire for for many actors you know right. those those long-running um medical or, or police shows or whatever yeah. so so I did that and little bits and pieces you know um and then I got a part in Doctor Who which was a bit more high profile um <laughs> but just a, f a few episodes here and there you know um and really the transition was was very gradual, I think, you know, and, until certainly until I did Hamlet, I, you know, mm. I hadn't ever worked in American TV and being able to do a TV show here, you know, directed by J.J. Abrams at the time, um, which was called Un Undercovers, which, you know, only went for one season. But it was an amazing mm. experience for me, um, mm -hmm. especially having done you know, Shakespeare for six months to suddenly be in LA right. and doing a, a, a sort of a spy show, you know, um, was, was a huge, <laughs> a huge transition. And working with Tom Hanks around that time as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh Amazing. My gosh. So incredible. It was, you know, it was a whirlwind, um, you know, that, that year, as I say, and, you know, Tom Hanks acting and directing being directed by him and acting alongside him mm. in Larry Crown was really my first film. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, he knew that I'd just worked with JJ and, you know, and I did, that was one of my first auditions, uh, you know, that I did in an, an American accent in America. Ah, okay. uh, and, you know, <laughs> I, I'd heard that they only wanted, you know, Americans or for the role, they didn't really want a Brit or an Australian for the part. <laughs> had to sort of pretend um I, I i didn't i didn't lie exactly <laughs> but i did have to you know when i met tom hanks at the recall you know my agent suggested that i do an american accent um 
for the, for the meeting. And I kind okay. of was like, whoa, this is like one of my first ever meetings in, in LA. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I, so I did for a bit and we talked for a bit and then he sort of asked me, you know, where did I go to college? And I suddenly was like, oh my God, this is going to fall apart. I hadn't like got oh, my no. back, my backstory straight. I was just doing the accent. <laughs> I hadn't done the American on my whole life in America. So I, you know, I broke it and, and I explained and, uh, you know, that I, you know, wanted to get the part, but you know, and so it funny. it worked. It did work, but it was it was nerve wracking. But I just thought, well, what have I got to lose? Today's podcast is brought to you by the Apple TV Plus original series, The Morning Show. This drama series explores the cutthroat world of morning news and the lives of the people who help America wake up in the morning, told through the lens of two complicated women working to navigate the minefield of high octane jobs while facing crises in both their personal and professional lives. Starring Jennifer Aniston, Reese Witherspoon, Steve Carell, Billy Crudup, Gugu Mbatha-Ra, and Mark Duplass. For your Emmy consideration in all eligible categories, including Outstanding Drama Series, visit fyc.appletvplus.com. Of course, I want to like dig into your character building process. Mm. Um, first of all, how do you do accents? Are you working with a coach? Like, what is your um, what's your approach there? Hmm. It really depends. It's it's sort of project to project and, you know, depends on the s- specifics of the character. Obviously, at drama mm-hmm. school, we did a lot of dialect work. And, you know, I think I've probably naturally always had quite a good ear, even as a child before I... <laughs> considered acting I was always imitating and mimicking people's voices and accents Mm. you know from tv from teachers from all sorts you know I mean I was I was a a mimic as a child so so that (laughs) was obviously always part of me um and then I've worked with great dialect coaches for for specific things you know early in my career in the U.S. you know I would always have a dialect coach on set um you know for for, Mm -hmm. for some of my early tv projects and then once I've you know spent a bit more time here and got a bit more comfortable because obviously it's it's around you all the time it's about it's been very immersive for me you know sure. being here and listening to the accent obviously I grew up watching a lot of American TV shows and I think hmm. um you just kind of absorb a lot uh, rhythmically through that mm-hmm. um and then, you know, some other things like, you know, misbehavior, for example, was an accent I'd never done and was quite terrified of, which is, right. you know, my character was from Grenada. And she also had quite a specific accent. She, It wasn't even, you know, it wasn't the strongest accent. It was also a period. It was 1970. You know, there were lots of layers yeah. to the way that she spoke that w- were quite a fusion. So um, I actually got to meet the real Jennifer Hostin, who I play in the movie. She oh, was, okay. you know, the first woman of color to be crowned Miss World um, right. in 1970. So I got to actually record her accent, uh, which was fascinating. And then listen to recordings of her from from then because obviously her accent has changed a little bit and then still work with a coach as well so so it depends and I don't always feel like I need a coach now um for a sort of more general standard American accent but if it's more regionally specific then then Mm. I would um would definitely work with someone okay Yeah, the Grenada, because that has to be so specific. How amazing that part of your research involved meeting the person you're playing. Oh, yeah, such a gift. I mean, you know, I... I've played a few people that really existed, but either, you know, don't, you know, hundreds of years ago, a while ago, <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> you know, you don't have access to them or you always think, gosh, you know, you'd love to like get in a time machine and ask Shakespeare actually what he meant by that, you know, <laughs> and it's great. Yes. Now it's up to us to interpret, but, um, but yeah, it's really special to, to play a real person who's also open to collaborating with you and sharing you know with you their experience and um jennifer was amazing i mean she's in her 70s now and you know that was such a pivotal moment in history when Mm. the women's liberation movement stormed the ceremony of of miss Mm. world in london but it was also the year the first woman of color won the competition so it was Mm -hmm. it was such a collision of events and um and to be able to talk to her about it now you know and especially you know her experience then and you know obviously how things have evolved 
in the present with you know me too and the women's movement of of recent yes. years um it's been it's been really lovely to get little details from her and she even lent me a dress uh that she <gasps> wore in the real competition um which you know was was very special and i actually went to grenada and and met her there uh so i could i was sort of did a deep dive of being able to sort of explore her culture and get her perspective on growing up there and also have you know a little holiday it's not it's not too uh uh (laughs) it's a delightful place so so to be able to go and also research the culture um was was a real treat Wow. Did you, was the dress worn in the film? Is it one of the costumes? It is one of the costumes. It's oh only very briefly do I wear it, but it's actually in the poster um, the, the, as oh, well. Cool. So I, I, it's, it's a gold, fascinating mm. gold crochet number <laughs> that she wore uh, <laughs> for the ball gown sequence of the ceremony. And, you know, I mean, she really mm-hmm. wanted a, you know, um, a designer from the Caribbean. It was actually designed by mm-hmm. a, a Trinidadian designer, um, but but you know um very very special to her and and uh cool. you know little details like that where you actually have an artifact from the time and you know it just gives yeah. you something it gives you a sense of confidence and pride in ownership in your character as well you know that's so cool yeah because we love hearing about the you know inside out versus outside in approach mm. I, mean, I, I don't know how much you think about that but costuming especially for something like that or like bell it mm. must affect how you play and how you construct the character, right? Definitely, definitely. And I think, you know, today we have such, you know, I mean, what women wear and what men wear are kind of interchangeable now. But I think, you know, certainly in mm. in, in period dramas, um, that, yeah. you know, there was such gender was so defined. It, and there was and certainly something like Belle with the corset or mm-hmm. petticoats or, you know, they totally change your posture. You you do feel confined. It does make you feel, you know, it just is a total um, analogy really for women's place in society. You know, you were supposed to be dainty mm. and, and small. You couldn't really breathe. <laughs> You couldn't yeah. really exert yourself. Um, and um, and that, you know, changes your posture, changes ha- mm. how you breathe, how you speak. I mean, I love all of that stuff. I think it just totally informs you and gets you off of your natural center. I also love to use fragrance. I've, you know, um, yes. often chosen different scents for different characters um just things that either either if it's a modern thing something a perfume that i think the character would wear or if it's a Mm -hmm. more um you know looking at aromatherapy and looking at how scent changes your mood you know for a certain energy that you want for a character how you can use that as well Um, that's fascinating yeah, it's it's you know it came from when I had two jobs at the same time and I I was doing a t- ah. TV two different TV projects in the UK and and you know I was sort of a guest artist on both and I would yeah. be like one day you know doing something on Spooks and another day doing something on Doctor Who or whatever and I I, I can't remember if it was those two but but it was it was you know it was tricky for me I just needed something that would instantly put me in the headspace of the person, you know, uh, when you're back and wow. forth between different people. And, and I found scent to be just, it just transported you there and it, it takes you away from your, yourself. That's so fascinating. And I've, I've never heard of that technique before. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cause you mentioned, of course, it's, it's project to project. Like each role is a, is a completely different thing, but are there other things, including this, this scent like technique <laughs> Are there things that you do every time in approaching a character? Ah, well, I mean, obviously there's the basics, like reading the script and learning your lines. And, you know, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I often make a playlist. Um, okay. So music is 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 mm. very helpful for me. Nearly always I make a playlist. Um, and that can be... Um, you know, any number of things from a song that will, or a piece of music that will get me into a mo- an emotional place, um, mm-hmm. or will help me get to like the right vibration without sounding like woo woo, but like, you know, music vibrationally, emotionally, you know, I think it can put you in a certain place to, to release, um, certain emotions, be they, mm-hmm. you know, um, 
joyful or or you know more somber or um more intense um so mm. that's something i love to do and i love to play my playlist you know either in my trailer on my way to work or on set if i need a bit of quiet time just put my earphones in you know there's so often so many distractions on set and if you're preparing mm. for a scene an intense scene and you just want a bit of headspace um mm-hmm. music really helps me for that so um so yeah, and then and then really just obviously the sort of collaborative work of working with a director mm. and and your fellow actors and you know doing your homework, but then also being open on the day to you know I think huh. it's great to have techniques and it's great to have all these things you know, but it's it's also you've got to be prepared to kind of throw it all out the window in the moment and be spontaneous as well. You know, those are only things there to support you um, and help you. Mm. But, um, but also it's, it's obviously important to, to work, you know, not in isolation, but with, with the people around you. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's super cool to hear about the, the prep work and the research, but then of course on the day of it's, it is a slightly different, you've, is it safe to say you laid the foundation and then you're ready to, build on top of that in the moment. Yeah. And I always remember this got from drama school. I think uh, on our first day, uh, the principal of RADA gave us this piece, I think by Martha Graham to Cecil Mm -hmm. B. DeMilne about keeping the channel open. I used to have it stuck on my wall. I don't have it anymore. I'll have to look it up, but about, about being open. And it's all always Mm -hmm. about keeping the channel open. You know, you can always have all of these different influences in life, but you've got to stay also open to, to what's what's in front of you. Mm-hmm. Well, and of course, I want to ask about the morning show because I do, yeah. when I think about, it is it is quite an ensemble show. What I kind of loved about the morning show was it didn't seem like an ensemble show at first. Mm. And then it became one where the relationships between the characters became more important as it went on. Mm. And in your character's case in particular, I remember it was like ha- having watched half of the season um, someone was saying, oh, Gugu Mbata Ra's performance is so amazing. And I said, oh, oh, it is. But she hasn't really been in it quite as much as the other people. Yeah. And it it wasn't quite an ensemble show until the end when your character's role in the story became more apparent. Mm. And I would love to ask you about arcs and how to create a character arc over the course of I believe this was 10 episodes. Yes, yes. No, thank you, because people don't always ask about th- those sorts of things. And I think for me, that's always what I'm looking for in any character. You know, you don't have to be the lead. Right. You don't have to have all of the screen time, but you need to have a journey. Mm-hmm. You need to feel right. like your character starts at one place and ends somewhere else. You know, and, and sometimes even I read scripts that even though the character is on every page of the script what is their arc what are they learning how has this Mm. journey changed them and and even if they're in on every page of the script if they haven't changed by the end it's not an interesting role to play you know (laughs) so it's not always about quantity but I think it's about breadth Mm. you know for me it's about breadth of um journey and um certainly with the morning show obviously knowing that Jennifer Aniston, you know, this was her return to TV since Friends. I knew this was going to be a big deal, but also Reese Witherspoon, Steve Carell, you know, incredible actors that, you know, I wanted to learn from. Mm. Um, But also, you know, like you said, Hannah's arc is not really apparent um, in the first Mm. half of the season, really. And um, so when I read the first scripts, the, the writing was was so great. I thought it was witty and muscular and, you know, these characters were sort of larger than life and narcissistic and, you know, the fascinating behind the scenes look of, of that sort of morning, morning show kind of world. But I spoke on the phone uh, with Mimi Leader and Kerry uh, Aaron, the showrunner and director. Right. And just because I was like, well, where is this going? Because this this is great and these actors are great, but, you know, <laughs> what, what, where is this going from for my yeah. character? And, you know, they were generous enough to basically pitch me the whole of Hannah's arc over the okay. phone because the scripts hadn't been written, you know, but obviously they, they were working on them and they knew where it was going. Uh, so when they explained to me where things went for her and how that was going to be a huge you know, climactic, um, pivotal Mm storyline for the whole season. I was, you know, very, very drawn to it. And it, it just gave me chills. I just felt like it was Mm -hmm. such a powerful storyline and, um, you know, one that 
culturally we've been wrestling with the last few years the idea of yes. you know abuse of power in the workplace sexual predators but also the fact that they were wanting to show the gray area of that that mm. world and and from so many different perspectives so i thought it was really nuanced yeah it's so it's so cool to hear because often for tv shows you don't know where the arc is going to go mm. but i imagine for this if you hadn't been clued in by the sh- by the showrunners, if you hadn't had that conversation, would it have been more difficult? I mean, you needed the backstory in order to start laying like a groundwork for us to be surprised later, right? Oh, a hundred percent. And that's where I struggle with some forms of TV, and why I haven't done mm. a huge amount of of tra- okay. traditional episodic TV because I think mm. it's very disempowering to the actor just to say, "Hey, show up." And, you know, you don't know where you're going. Reinvent a backstory. Yeah, it's different. It's different. I mean, listen, we don't know how our, what our, what our arc is in our lives. So you could argue, (laughs) I don't know how this is going to end for me, but I'm just living in the moment. So that's, that's one way. But obviously, um, as an actor, as an artist, you, you want to pace yourself. You want to structure a performance. You want to have control over the storytelling and you want as an artist to be given the chance to make choices so that Mm -hmm. if you know where you're going, you can structure the rhythm of everything to sort of make it more satisfying and and do that consciously um, as opposed to, you know, just handing that over to, you know, an editor at a writer's room to to steer you and you're just sort of a a pawn that that turns up, you know, and I think that's, that's why I found film. So, so satisfying because you can have a beginning, middle and end and you you have control over, um, structuring and, and, you know, layering your performance, um, as necessary. Right. That's so cool to hear. I mean, it's so true that as an actor, you're looking for narrative. You're looking mm. for beginning, middle, and end. Mm. And is that mostly because you want to avoid the the monotone? You want to avoid having your character go nowhere? Yeah. And I think, I, as I say, you want to feel like you are making conscious choices. And, you mm-hmm. know, like in the morning show, obviously, I knew where things were going. And we had some scenes early on, even though Hannah, you know, is is in and out of, of, of the world, you get a sense that she's good mm-hmm. at her job. She's a career woman, you know, and I had some scenes in like the sep- second episode where where she goes to try and get Ashley Brown, another former employee on the show. And there were definitely, mm-hmm. you know, nuances in that scene that I, knowing Hannah's motivations, knowing, yes. um, you know, what's at stake for her and perhaps that she is, you know, that much more ruthless and manipulative with Ashley because Ashley can, you know, um, expose Mitch where Hannah hasn't been able to, to you know. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so that gave it a bit more, wow. that charged it for me. No, no, having that information. I mean, I could have played the scene completely fine without without it, mm. but I don't think it would have had yeah. for me as an actor. You know, the intensity um, and uh, you know, just as as we are in in real life, we're always hiding certain things, but we we have things we're passionate about under the surface, and um, you mm. know, that was definitely something that we discussed um, with with the director Mimi Lida. Right. And that is a lot of, that does involve a lot of talking to the director, right? Like I think of twists, uh, the ingredients of a good twist is that it has to be both surprising and inevitable, mm. somehow both. Mm. And I sort of considered the reveal of you, of Hannah's role in this story as, as to be that an example of like, somehow Gugu and the director mm. have laid a groundwork. And I don't know what that groundwork is. Maybe you don't either. Yeah. <laughs> But it works on some subconscious level so that at the end, you've had the rug pulled out from under you, but not in a way that's jarring. Yeah. Well, it's like what we were saying at the beginning about people in our society, you know, that the pandemic has revealed the unseen people that then become heroic, you know. Uh, Uh, And and I think that is, you know, it it takes your breath away sometimes, you know, when you realize, oh, I've taken this person for granted. And yet, actually, they are 
you know, hugely, you know, they're carrying these huge burdens for our society or they're suddenly, you know, and I think similarly with Hannah, you know, you just thought she was fine. She was ambitious. She was, you know, you, and the trauma underneath, you know, mm. was, was, was always there. But I think obviously, and, you know, masterfully woven in by Kerry Aaron structuring the flashback episode in episode eight, yes. you know, um, where, mm. Hannah and 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 Steve Carell's character Mitch, you know, obviously have that um, pivotal scene um, in the hotel room and the, the sexual yeah. assault that that goes on, you know. But being able to structure that in a way that it it did happen in the past, and you know how mm-hmm. she then becomes triggered um, by by current events, um, right, is is really fascinating. Way to bring it back to the start of the interview about the <laughs> essential work. I mean, goodness, that's so true. Well, no, it just it just occurred to me in the moment. I mean, you know, yeah. like you say, who do we take for granted, and and yes. and and who actually, as I say, is really doing the moving work behind the scenes? Yeah, we're not conscious of those things probably most of the time. Yeah. Mm, mm. Well, way to bring it full circle. I mean, I got to let you go soon, but I have some backstagey actorly questions i would love to ask you babe (laughs) i thought so (laughs) we always so we always ask everyone about how they got their sag card or their equity card yeah but you you mentioned um was hamlet did you get your american actors equity card by your broadway debut in hamlet i think i got it um i got my sag card from larry crown that's for sure uh which was Mm -hmm. the film i did with tom hanks um and i had in the uk i was already a member of you know we have equity in the uk so i had Mm -hmm. that from the very beginning my first theater job probably as you like it um Mm -hmm. in the uk and then you know actors equity um in in the u.s um from Hamlet and then SAG from Larry Crown. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, what is one performance that you think every actor should see and why? Ooh, that's so interesting. Let me, I'm going to have to think about that for a second. <laughs> yes. One performance. Oh, gosh. I would say anything by Philip Seymour Hoffman. I just think he's so masterful. Uh-huh. I don't have one performance, but I was just re watching talented mr ripley the other day and 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 uh, um you know i i love his performance in that i mean i love his performance in in everything he does and as a body of work i'm so sad he's not around anymore but he's mm-hmm. he's one of my favorite actors to look at his his body of work that's a great answer yes <laughs> um do you have a worst audition horror story <laughs> <laughs> do I I I don't have anything I don't have anything up my sleeve I don't have I don't I haven't had terrible auditions um okay. yeah I, I I don't have any horror stories oh. well good I mean that's good yeah you mentioned the audition for Tom Hanks um of the of your big roles did you audition for Bell yes I did yes okay. I did yeah did you audition for the morning show no no okay. I didn't <laughs> no gotcha yeah so has your career kind of done the trajectory of there are fewer and fewer auditions and maybe more meetings? Yes, I would say so. I mean, I, you know, I, I, yes, I think, you know, I've been privileged enough to have a body of work behind me where I get mm-hmm. offered things, which is great, you know, and I would always want to meet with the director and I would be open to auditioning. Um, you know, I think, so often when you are in that place where you get offered things, it's because people offer you things that they know you can do. But I, mm-hmm. I'm i always loath to get in a position then where you only get offered things that you've sort of done before, you know, because people know you can do them. And so if you want to sure. surprise people or play something completely yeah. um, against type or, I mean, I try not to do anything with a type, but obviously, um, mm-hmm. you know, something that people aren't sure you could pull off, that that's always the most exciting stuff for me. So, um, right. yeah. I do. I see that in your body of work for sure. You're You're making an effort to not to have a wide variety in a body of work. Yeah, well, I think it, you know, it keeps me interested. I think it keeps you growing as an artist, hopefully, you know, stretching different muscles in different Mm -hmm. directions. And, and as I say, stops you from becoming, um, you know, to, it stops it, people from putting you in a box too easily, you know, um, which I think is just, I don't know, that's been my sort of, um, Mm -hmm. my tool for, for longevity, hopefully. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. 
No, I mean, you've worked nonstop. This, this, as you were saying in your essay, the pandemic has really slowed your career down mm. and given you the rest maybe that, <laughs> that you... Yeah, well, you know, I feel like you, you do have to, without sounding pretentious, I think it is important to refill the creative well, you know, and that can come through Absolutely. many ways, be it just, you know, taking a step back, doing something else, painting, reading, you know, just watching watching great performances. And I think mm -hmm. acting can be so all-consuming and immersive. You realise if you mm -hmm. do it a lot, you can also miss out on, on life, you know. <laughs> right. So I think, you know, it's important. And, and it's been, you know, obviously people have been really suffering and I, I certainly would never want to make light of that Um but but for me, in, in the privileged position of being able to hopefully try and reframe this time as a as a sort of reflective time to grow and learn and, um, you know, use it as an opportunity um, to to develop as an artist and and, right. and a person. <laughs> totally. Um, can I ask about auditions, too? The that prep work that you just got, the scent work, the playlists, the research, do you do any of that for auditions? Hmm. Um, not so much. It depends. I mean, you know, certainly the prep work, if, if I need to work on a dialect, um, hmm. and uh, right. usually, obviously, I'll read as much material as I can. You know, sometimes for auditions, you don't get the whole script it depends exactly. who you're right. working with you know so or if it's something that you can watch something around that genre you know um that's interesting to me to tonally if if you're doing something that's already got an, on an established tone um yeah but but no I probably don't go quite as deep into it until I've got the part because I think mm -hmm. then there's a different commitment then you know um yeah, it, it, it depends. It depends on the character. Right. right, yeah. That's very it's very cool to hear the the inner workings of your process in this <laughs> way. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Of course. Um last question. If you could go back in time and give your younger self one piece of um acting or career advice, what would that be? Hmm. I mean, I don't think I'd change anything. I think I'd just mm -hmm. say just keep being brave just you know don't worry hmm. about too much about what people think um just be braver <laughs> um, braver be mm. bold yeah <laughs> that's great advice yeah well gosh thank you so much i i gotta let you go but i could easily talk to you for hours more oh. about all this stuff oh, and i really appreciate you. you taking the time thank you so much it's been fascinating for me and uh you know i really appreciate <laughs> all your questions your actor your actory backstage <laughs> questions uh, the, yes. the things we don't always get to to explore so i appreciate <laughs> exactly. it thank you gosh okay cool have a good one yes and um Stay safe and stay sane. Thank you. I'll try. You too. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.